On this episode of China Unscripted, mass ethnic cleansing is happening in China under the guise of forced organ harvesting. And Taiwan could be the next victim. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. Joining us today is award-winning China analyst and human rights investigator Ethan Gutman. He's the author of Losing the New China and the Slaughter, Mass Killings, Organ Harvesting, and China's Secret Solution to its Dissident Problem. He's also a research fellow in China studies at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, and he's working on a new book tentatively called The Xinjiang Procedure. Ethan, great to have you back on the podcast. Great to be here. So, you know, and you, you've been covering forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience in China for over a decade. And, you know I, know, I know with crimes against humanity, you don't really want to rush things too much. You don't want to take action too quickly. But, you know, the U.S. government is finally starting to do some things. Uh, uh, can you give us a little update? Well, yeah. I, as far as I'm concerned, they're terribly premature in their actions. This whole thing is very half-baked. Hasn't even been two decades. Uh, seriously, my book is about three three years late, uh, and uh, I feel very guilty about that. But nonetheless, people have started to uh, operate uh, in the U.S. government on two findings. Uh, one was by Jacob Levy and Matt Robertson, which did a kind of a uh, huge data scrape of the internet, of the Chinese internet, and were able to show that doctors are commonly... Uh, uh, operating, uh, they're doing live organ harvesting. I mean, you can describe it a number of different ways. And, uh, they're, they're not respecting the brain dead rule and so forth. But really, it comes down to that. They're doing live organ harvesting. Now, this is something we've known about for years because way back, uh, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, uh, Enver Totti admitted, uh, the Uyghur doctor admitted that he uh, performed live organ harvesting on a execution ground in Xinjiang. That was back in the 90s, right? Yeah, well, it was back in the 90s. And he uh, he was the first person to kind of stand up and say, I did, I did this with my own hands. Uh, and uh, uh, that was a very important uh, admission. Uh, over the years, he's gotten a little more comfortable saying, look, I killed this person. <laughs> they, they, they actually could have lived. Uh, they, they have been shot in a non-lethal way. I could have fixed them up, but instead I was told to remove their liver and kidneys, and I did that, and the man died. Uh, we don't know if that man was a political prisoner or religious prisoner or just an ordinary uh, criminal. Uh, he did not have a, a short hair like a convict. He had long, uh, long normal hair. Uh, and that was in Xinjiang. It's very likely the man was a Uyghur, and it's very possible he was a political prisoner. What we've been able to determine since then was that the transplant industry was built on the back of uh, Falun Gong uh, bodies in general, majority. And uh, after that, uh, Uyghurs. But to actually come to that conclusion, you have to have some uh, studies out there. And, and uh, Matt Robertson and Jacob Levy put together a very nice study on this on the live organ harvesting issue, which only went up to 2015 because then it, everything cuts off. Uh, they stopped talking about it. They stopped uh, putting in little admissions uh, in their data. That was very compelling, particularly because it was published in the, um, uh, I believe in the American Journal of Transplantation, and uh, which is very respected. So within the medical world, this is uh, very important. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, the whole medical world's role in this, which is pivotal. At the same time, I have been uh, walking around, uh, you know, I, I put some paper out on it because I felt guilty, because when I went to Kazakhstan, I was able to establish that there was a, a rate of organ harvesting of Uyghurs in the camps. And I did this just through talking to refugees in Kazakhstan. Uh, what was interesting about the findings was not that I had so many, I had less than 20 people, but they were incredibly consistent from camp to camp. Nobody was in the same camp. And they all described something that if you, uh, it, uh, if you actually uh, interpreted what they were saying, it was about 2.5 to 5% of the camp goes missing every year. And that uh, within that, the average age is 28 years old. Uh, it's often exactly 28 or 29 years old. That is precisely the age that they Chinese prefer 
uh, Chinese medical establishment prefers for organ harvesting. And uh, it's also, I guess this is uh, important as well, is that this is usually following a test, always actually following a health check, what they call a health check, which is basically a blood test and uh, possibly a DNA kit is used as well to get a very, very good, what we call cross matching. That is, you can get a very exact match to somebody who's looking for an organ, be they a foreign, be they Chinese, it doesn't matter. Uh, that test is run about a week before the people disappear. And these people disappear in the middle of the night. What's interesting about them is that other people leave the camp. It's usually young people, and they're going off to work somewhere. It's even called graduating, and there's often applause that's encouraged. It's usually announced during lunch. These people just disappear in the middle of the night, and you're not supposed to speak about them again. It's very dangerous. They're on persons, like 1984. And... Uh, so they are also sometimes given certain signals. For example, one of the Chinese teachers in the camps, Asaryugo, saw that they put check marks by certain, after the blood test, they put up the blood test in the faculty lounge, just on a wall, and then they put check marks, pink check marks by some of the names. Those were the people who disappeared. And in fact, in some places, in some other camps, people were given pink wristbands or sometimes orange. In one other camp, uh, somebody described they had to put on a, a, a vest that was pink or orange. Okay, these were marked people. Now, that's not something I've written about in a formal way. That is, and I haven't, uh, I, I've written about it. I stand by those results. I have tapes of those interviews. But I haven't, you know, uh, fleshed them out in a granular fashion. But that's what I'm doing now is for a new book is to, do that. That's one part of the new book. Uh, and that has been picked up by Congress. So I want to ask you a bit about the Uyghurs that you interviewed in Kazakhstan. You said you interviewed 20 people and they're all from different camps, mm -hmm. right? Now, the, the, the chances of 20 refugees being from 20 different camps uh, is pretty low unless there's an enormous number of camps. There's got to be at least 100. Otherwise, it's too big of a coincidence. Right. That's it's well over a hundred. It's 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 considerably over a hundred. I don't want to venture a number on that because there's uh, arguments and debate about that. Uh, you know, my book I'll have to address that subject, but I'm not really there yet. Look, I, I, I don't. It, it, I I think it's kind of um, abstract in this case. Uh, the Chinese don't even name the camps for God's sake. They're numbered. They no, they don't even give them numbers. I mean, this is what's astonishing. It's very hard to identify these camps except on Google Earth. And only some people can do that. Uh, but nonetheless, they're clearly in different places and they're clearly different camps. And there are, there are enormous numbers. And so, you know, I've taken the most conservative estimate, which is about a million Uyghurs in detention at any given time. Now, a lot of most of my witnesses actually weren't Uyghur. They were actually Kazakh because Kazakhs have an unusual ability to get out of the country. Uh, because they have relatives in Kazakhstan, they're ethnic Kazakh. They have relatives in Kazakhstan. Sometimes they can, you know, lobbying can be arranged. Sometimes uh, just getting across the border somehow can be arranged. So, and, so these are people who graduated from the camps and then escaped. No, they didn't graduate. They didn't graduate. They these are people who basically got out after doing their time. That is a year, year and a half, two years. Uh, and usually they got out because there was some kind of pressure coming from inside Kazakhstan uh, from the family. Maybe a bribe was paid. Uh, we didn't get into that that much. That's, a, again, that's another, that some other people have studied that more extensively than me. I'm more interested in what their experience in the camp was. The difficulty then becomes, these are Kazakhs. So they're not wedded to the Uyghur cause, if you like. Cossacks and Uyghurs are friends, they're, they're like cousins, but they're not always friends. In some cases, one man told me, you know, were there any disappearances in the camp? And he said, no. And I said, what do you mean? There were no disappearances at all. He said, not among the Cossacks. And I said, well, well, well you know, what, what, what about the Uyghurs? And he said, I only care about the Cossacks. <laughs> and I, I, come and I said, well, thank, thank you, brother. You know, it's good to, it's good to hang out. <laughs> you know, he's a great guy, actually. A uh, very funny guy. And, uh, he, you know, the Kazakhs, they were clearly going through the motions more on the Kazakhs. In other words, I did not discover that Kazakhs were being uh, disappearing for organ harvesting. That does not mean it doesn't happen. But 
I didn't get that. All right. I have to go with my results here. I did not get that. However, they're excellent witnesses. Why? Because they don't have as much skin in the game, right? They're not wedded to the Uyghur cause. They have no reason to exaggerate things. Uh, they're very good witnesses because, well, partly because these days you can't talk in the camps uh, because their surveillance is total everywhere from toilet to where you sleep uh, uh, to where you work. You know, the surveillance is there. And so people don't talk. And if they do talk, it's just sort of like, can you hand me that wrench kind of stuff? Uh, and they, what that does is a little bit like somebody dying of hunger. Your, your, your sense of smell and, and your taste buds get better, actually, and your, your eyesight gets keener. And this was true in this case as well. So there are very, very observant people who have no skin in the game. Therefore, I find their, their, uh, uh, their testimony is very, very credible. Uh, which is why I've kind of stood by it. And I've, I've had no trouble saying that I get this 2.5 to 5%, which are, you know comes out at about 35,000 uh, people being harvested a year, approximately, if you assume a million in the camps. Well, so I think big picture, it's, it's very clear the Chinese Communist Party is going to make this very difficult to research and get data on. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. <laughs> to say the least. But I've seen over the years, uh, just so much has come out that what once was considered just this fringe conspiracy theory, yeah. now we have people in the House of Representatives talking about it seriously. Well, that's the astonishing thing, isn't it? This is the amazing uh, transformative change. And you see, what happened in Congress, in my view, did not start there. It started... Uh, now, I, I give huge credit to the who the man who brought us to the dance, which is Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey. Okay. You know, all hail him because he, he is the one who has really pushed this and made this happen to the point where you could actually pass the stop organ harvesting act of 2023, 2009, uh, uh, <laughs> 219 to two or whatever the vote was. It was, uh, and, and then the poor two people who, who didn't vote for it. Who is that sort of crazy lady? Um, Marjorie, Marjorie Taylor, Taylor Green, Green. And, and the other guy from Kentucky, the libertarian guy, okay. uh, Steele or something. I forget. Uh, who he just saying. votes against everything, him. though, right? Well, so. okay, but he's a libertarian, you know, and I understand that. But that's kind of why I'm not a libertarian. Is is you know sort of hit, <laughs> using him as an example. But leaving that aside, they got a lot of flack for that, which is great because when the Senate brings out its version of the bill. Uh, people will be very afraid to vote for it. It's cancel culture. What do you want? You know, so there'll be, you know, people will fall into line. Vote against it, you mean. Vote against it. I'm sorry, to vote against it. And uh, most likely Biden will, <laughs> I don't imagine him vetoing it. Uh, so I think it's going to pass. And, and what will this bill do if it passes? Not that much. I mean, something. It will. What it basically does is it prevents uh, Chinese transplant surgeons from uh uh, from visiting the United States. That's key. Now, you may say, well, so what? Okay. Well, that's true. But for Chinese uh, surgeons, this is a very big deal. And this is a huge loss of face. Uh, and it also means they can't come to the conferences and so forth. Uh, medical conferences, they can't come to the universities, uh, they can't give uh, lectures, and they can't make deals on uh, medical equipment and so forth. Uh, particularly robotics, which is uh, picking up right now in the transplant world. All of these issues uh, will come together on that, as well as the fact that uh, the bill sort of opens up a line of investigation on um, not exactly organ brokers, but on anybody who assists the Chinese organ harvesting juggernaut uh, will be, uh, can be exposed and rather publicly. And third, and I think this is the weakest part, is that supposedly it, it, it's going to authorize a, you know, a lot of research on this, a Manhattan Project of Research. I have not seen that yet. I, I am very interested in that, that research project and, and, and very interested in uh, the funding for that research project, but I haven't seen anybody sort of knocking at my door. Can you name any like prominent uh, organ harvesting researchers who you think should be getting this kind of funding? Mm. It's hard to come up with a name, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. There's only a handful of us. <laughs> there. I mean, I mean, you know, obviously there's David Matus. Uh, there was David Kilgore until recently. Uh, obviously, uh, Jacob Levy and Matt Robertson. And uh, there's this guy, Ethan Gutman. And 
Yeah. You know, there's a few. You know, we haven't seen a lot out of the journalist world, let's face it. Which is surprising. Sort of strangely enough, they haven't jumped into this. I always talk to my son about that. I say, you know, son, you know, I was kind of hoping that you wouldn't go into law, but you'd, you know, go into the family business, the human rights. You know, in our own way, I think we've helped this community. And um, you know, <laughs> sort of the whole, <laughs> it's a wonderful life shtick. And, uh, I mean, the, the, the human rights industry is joyous and full of, you know, lots of fun opportunities, right? <laughs> It's it's, it's 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 you know it's a little too cushy sometimes as a lifestyle. Uh, but okay. But the point is, well, let's leave the funding aside because maybe that's not the answer. Is government funding? The interesting thing here is that the basis of the whole thing, uh, the reason why that bill emerged in this year and and uh, just a month and a half ago passed, uh, was really because of the ISHLT. Now that is a this is the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation. Well, you can say, well, you know, okay, heart and lung transplant doctors are very powerful. Yeah, they're really powerful. They're, they make kidney, uh, uh, kidney and liver transplant doctors are a little bit lower on the, on the totem pole. <laughs> uh, this is just one of the natures, uh, one of the things I've discovered. They're a little bit like the Cubans in Central America or something. They're not small island boys. They have through partly through Jacob Levy, but not through him alone. They have for some time now been far more critical of the uh, Chinese uh, medical system or the Chinese transplant industry than their uh, friends at the uh, Transplantation Society, which supposedly represents all transplant doctors all over the world. Now, that's a long history, and I don't know if you want to go into that today, the ins and outs of that, but we could. But, well, I mean, but there's, the, there's certainly been what you're saying is there's there's been a lot of resistance over the last, I guess, two decades or decade and a half. Actually, let's go into the history for a second here, because stories are good and they're important. And I think uh, this isn't something that everybody knows. Look, in 2012, there was a, there had been enough noise made about the uh, uh, what the Chinese were doing in terms of forest organ harvesting that the the uh, transplantation society specifically francis del monaco the president of the transplantation society at that time approached the chinese very directly and said we want you to reform we hear these terrible things about you organ harvesting from prisoners all kinds of prisoners all agog and so forth and uh we're here to help you reform. we've done it in africa we've done it in other places and we want to help you now the Chinese made, I'm going to cut to the, make the story short here and say the Chinese basically made a deal. They said, yeah, we absolutely want to do that. We want to reform. But there are some bad people in China who do not want us to reform. There's some bad people in the party and the party is split. And you need to give us some, you need to give us plenty of, of uh, leash here. And you, you cannot embarrass anybody. So you just talk about prisoners. Do never talk about fallen God and never talk about Uyghurs or any, any other group or Christians or Tibetans, and just refer to prisoners. And by gum, after 2012, they had some negotiations back and forth. They visited China again and again. And by 2015, uh, the Chinese said, we are no longer harvesting prisoners starting this, uh, January 1st. You know, if now, I can interrupt for just yeah, a second, course, course, uh, yeah. that that reminds me a lot of, I believe, Matt, it was Alex Joski who came on the show and said that that was basically how China handled the U.S., went to prominent U.S. politicians and said, hey, you know, there are hardliners in the party. We want reforms, but there are hardliners. So if you come out and are aggressive, well, then that will just support them. And then exactly. it'll so just, just exactly. you know, go soft. Don't criticize China. And, you know, then, you know, us reformers will take over and everything it, will be fine. It's it's incredible that it works, but like also 2012 when this was all happening, it was the same year that that Xi Jinping promised uh, U.S. President Obama that China would not militarize the South China Sea, and we see how how well that went. Well, so, there's a lot of promises that year. That was a great year for promises. It was a great year for promises, As you know. And and the thing is, uh, but what makes this a little different than the case uh, that was just mentioned by Chris is. You know, most politicians in Washington have some sense that they don't really know China and that they kind of need help and they need a staff and, you know, they need sort of people to vet things. 
only the arrogance of somebody like Francis Del Monaco would go into China with nothing, with no translator, no fixer, no nobody, okay? I used to work in China. I was one of those guys who would help companies set up a little team so they could do a negotiation in China. And, you know, you can say, well, you know, we were kind of leeches on the business process, but we weren't. It was, it's legitimate. Why the hell would you come into China and just try to make a deal? These are the deal makers of the, the you know, of, of the centuries, as everybody says. They, they, they think in you know, hundreds of years, not, you know, in uh, hundreds of seconds like we do. I mean, this is, you, you would be mad to do what they did. And you'd be mad to fall for the red carpet, and they did. They fell for every inch of this stuff. And the only reason that we eventually saw some pushback was because of a very heroic reporter named Didi Kirsten Tatlow, who worked for the New York Times. And Didi Kirsten Tatlow, I'd been in touch with her and talked to her about this issue, and she was already kind of investigating it. But she said one thing to me that was very interesting. It was on Signal. It was a secure line. She's in Beijing. On she said, you know, I'm, I'm worried about my kids. They're both in kindergarten in Beijing. And I said, oh, your kids will be fine. Nobody's going to take it out of them. Leave, they, the Chinese leave the bambini out of this, if you're, if you're, at least if you're white, you know. <laughs> she said, okay, fair enough. She said, but Ethan, you know the kinds of stories I do. Will I still be able to do them? I said, no, you won't get the access. And she said, well, I'm going to have to think about this. Well, she thought about it. She talked to Jacob Levy, whose parents came out of the camps, they're the Holocaust survivors. And, and she wrote to him, and he leaked the email to me, and she said, I have no choice. I'm German. I, you're Jewish. I have to do this story. This is real. I know it's real. And she did do the story. And she got it into the New York Times in kind of a soft launch, just sort of saying there's an issue about this. But eventually she started writing harder stuff and sort of saying, why is the Vatican and uh, trying to make a deal with uh, – Huang Jiefu, the master of ceremonies of transplantation in China, and she embarrassed the Chinese very much. And guess what? All her access was cut off, and she was out of the New York Times six months later. Didn't she testify in the China Tribunal that uh, she did. there was some? Yes, she did testify, but she testified in the closed door session. She's mm. the only person who did that. I mean, there were witnesses there, <laughs> you know, family over in China, but she did it in the closed door session, which indicates her. Somewhat bitterness. I mean, she called me up at one point and said, Ethan, I have a question for you. How do you make money, you know, doing human rights? And I said, listen, when I know the answer to that, I'll get back to you. I promise. I swear to God. I'm <laughs> and I, I, actually, I, I owe her a call because I now have some sense of how to make a little bit of money doing uh, human rights, or at least not to make a living. But the point is uh, she sacrificed herself in a sense. She knew what she was doing. She's no dummy. And uh, in the process, she em embarrassed the Transplantation Society very much because it was revealed that they're basically doing a semantic trick. They're pretending that no prisoners of conscience are being harvested. They're only, when they refer to prisoners, they're just referring to the prisoners people don't really care that much about, frankly, which is murderers and rapists. I mean, I'm sorry, nobody's really losing sleep over that issue. What we're losing sleep over is, you know, pregnant women being put under the knife, okay, uh, you know, who've done nothing and, uh, you know, who've said Allah Akbar or something, you know, I mean, you know, or, or, you know, Falun Gong is good. I mean, so the point is that we had a, 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 a shift and then, but results were, were really did it because that's when the Uyghur in 2015 is when the Uyghurs start getting their health checks. They're getting their health checks. And then a year later, they're going into the camps, 2016. And I mean, this was, you know, even if you didn't have actual results, anybody could put it together who was in the medical community. They ran out of Falun Gong. They started running out of Falun Gong at the right age. What, so so what, what do you mean they ran out of Falun Gong? Because there's like, you know, tens of millions of people, presumably, who practiced at some point, at least in, in China. Well, that's certainly a practice at some point. But in 2013, uh, Ming Hui reported six cases in six different provinces of the Chinese police coming into Falun Gong homes. Now, this was the first time that it happened. Came into the homes, forced their way in in some cases, and took blood samples and DNA cheek swabs. So we even know back then you didn't use the you didn't tend to use the blood for the the uh, DNA. So he actually did a cheek swab. It was sort of a little more primitive. Well, why are they doing that? Because that is the, if you have a huge sample 
of a huge pool of uh, blood types and and, 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 and and people, living people waiting, uh, you the, the combination of blood, and I don't know quite why this is, but DNA and blood together gives you the perfect cross-matching or tissue typing, okay? I read that as a signal that not of Chinese being punitive because the Chinese part of well, Beijing is always punitive. I read it as a signal they were starting to run out of people at that right age, at 28 years old, 29 years old, which is absolutely when they prefer to do this kind of organ harvesting. And that is plausible to me. Because Which, so they, they were running. So they were running out of people in the camps, and so they expanded their search to like yes, exactly people right. that they thought were Falun Gong yes. practitioners, but just living in their homes. That's right, exactly. But that okay. indicates that is a, a significant shift. And there's also signs of an uptick at the same time in Tibetan organ harvesting, and even to some extent Christian organ harvesting. They're casting around for different other types. And the other problem they had was this was a very controversial issue. Falun Gong are all over the country, okay? So it was a very haphazard thing. I mean, you could you you know you had uh, the armed police uh, and the PLA having nasty arguments in in court uh, over where this Falun Gong practitioner was going to go under whose auspices, and then there were bribes to judges from the armed police because there's a lot of money in this kind of transplantation, and they wanted a cut. Cut might be a poor choice of words. Yes, yes. No, I mean, it's, it's about half a million. I mean, a, a, a good, healthy person, not like me, but let's, I, I think we could say Matt, you know, Matt there. How, uh, how much am I worth? To me. You're, you're what's, worth? What's the value of my life, Ethan? You're worth half a million, but to a Japanese, wow. you're worth a million, okay? A million, because they, they don't like to bargain, so the prices are doubled for them. And maybe for Germany, about 750000 But for the average organ tourist, foreign organ tourist out there, you're half a million. You've got two good lungs, right? Right, yeah. Matt? Come on, Matt. Lungs. How about your uh, heart? Huh? Kind of dark, your, but otherwise healthy. How's your, how's your teeth? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> your eyes. Your, your eyes. You got, you've got two. Okay, I've got 15,000 numbers right here. I mean, these blue are, eyes, too. Those will, those will be a No, nah, no. Nah, we're just interested in the tissue. We don't care about your stupid blue eyes or, or you know anything like that or how well you can see. We just need these tissues, okay? And oh, we've boy. got a, probably yeah. a pretty good liver and, and some yeah. decent kidneys. Because I, I don't think yeah. remember you dr being a heavy drinker. I, mean, yeah. I remember us going out for tea. Uh, whatever tea slurpees, whatever those things are called, milk tea one time, uh, you know, and I don't remember you being like, okay, let's mix some rum in with that or anything. So, okay. So bottom line is you're half a million. Wow. That's uh, fantastic. I, my, my, my net worth has just gone up considerably. Don't tell your wife. I also think I see a way to pay off my student loan debts. <laughs> Let's not get into this because, well, I, <laughs> there was a Falun Gong practitioner I was working with who wanted to sell a kidney to get a documentary going at one point. I said, no, oh, no, 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 wow, no, no, that's, no, that's, no, 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 uh, A good publicity stunt, but bad, bad, bad for the cause. Uh, the Look, bottom line is uh, we are – Yes, it's very, very good money. And, but Falun Gong was distributed everywhere. And they're coming under a lot of heat. So what do you do? What is the smart thing to do? Well, you, you rationalize the system. Break it down so it's not 700 hospitals. Break it down until it's about 150 or 200 hospitals, which you can control. Uh, and make sure that you've got one single source. And what better source than Xinjiang, than the people of Xinjiang, the, the Uyghurs, Okay. Because you can fence off that area. You can cut off the internet. They've done it before. They've been doing it for years. And uh, you've got the greatest surveillance capabilities the world's ever seen in Xinjiang. And, and uh, have your way. And then you can rationalize it if you then have camps. And you can rationalize it so the camp is only allowed, say, two and a half to take about a certain amount to cull a certain amount of the population, about two and a half percent. That are right in this age group, 28, 29, 25 to 35, then you have a very, very good system. And furthermore, unlike Falun Gong, who had a tendency to get out of China through all kinds of methods, all kinds of crazy methods, uh, it's very, very, very hard for the Uyghurs to get out of the camps and out of, out of uh, Xinjiang at all. They never get passports. Yeah, I know in Xinjiang they even have org express lanes for organ transplants in the airports. Well, that's that's a whole other thing about the new. I, I mean, I'd like to get into this, which is which is 
who's buying those those uh, Uyghur organs. But let's finish your, your thought here. Well, I'm just saying, so the, basically you had, the TTS had failed in its soft reform effort. It had stalled, okay? And, but don't forget that Congressman Smith and other people, uh, other uh, other politicians, had been trying to pass laws on this, or at least pass resolutions on this for some time. And the fact is they never got anywhere. Uh, or, or they would stop. And the reason they would stop was because they didn't really, truthfully, I don't think they felt comfortable. If the medical world wanted to engage with China, how do you go against that? If the medical world saying, well, there's not really a problem here, or we think the problem's solved, it's very hard to make that next step. What happened is when the ISHLT stood up uh, just last year, they put together a resolution basically saying, we are having an academic boycott of China. The Chinese uh, transplant surgeons are not allowed to publish in our journal, the most desirable journal in the, in the entire field of heart and lung transplantation. That was very significant. That was a green light to Congress or maybe a red, maybe wave, waving a red flag and whatever metaphor you want. This basically gave them permission to go ahead. Uh, and it's very significant. And I'm not even sure the ISHLT, the, the, the heart and lung transplant surgeons, understood how, how important it was that they did that, that they made that move. But it was a signal to Washington. It was a flare in the night sky. Go ahead. We'll back you. On balance, we're with you, right? And that change, that shift. Now, we don't know how the rest of the medical world's going to take it. We don't know if we'll see a rear guard action for the Transplantation Society at this point or the WMA or, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to sort of follow the politics of this. But here's where I come in, in, in my own little cameo role. They invited me. So first, they make that uh, resolution that nobody can publish in their journal. It was from China. Secondly, the bill passes the House, and I get an invitation to be the keynote speaker at the ISHLT uh, annual conference in Denver. Hmm. And that's like, okay, so you're inviting a T-Rex to the conference because you think not, what could go wrong, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, like, it's like they know what I'm going to say. What am I going to say? It's like, you know what? I think China's really reformed, and we, we, we just have to – keep on them a little bit. No, that's not what I'm going to say. I'm going to put the whole thing out there. And that's what I did. I, they gave me 30 minutes. And, uh, you know, it was vi probably the most intimidating 30 minutes of my life because, uh, well, we all have problems with certain characters. I don't know about you, Matt, or you, Chris, but, but uh, you know, uh, uh, David Kilgore, for example, could not stand other politicians. I would go to meetings with him, and if he felt like they were giving us the runaround, he would just explode. He'd just say, okay, the meeting's over. There's nothing to talk about here. And, you know, I'd sort of sit there and he'd leave. <laughs> I'd sort of sit there and say, well, let's try to talk a little bit. Uh, I was like that with doctors. When I felt there was resistance from a <laughs> medical official, I would just, I'd be like, you know what, we meeting's over. We have nothing to talk about here because you're not even listening. You're, 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 not being, uh, you're not willing to look at the evidence. So I had to repress that and put together this talk, 30 minutes. And I wanted to also put in the whole field here, not just my own work, but everybody else's work too. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. And for mainly for audiences, audience who's largely beginners on this. Uh, but I was also aware that this was the most consequential 30 minutes of my life. If I was ever going to have an impact, it's not sitting in front of Congress, you know, giving a five minute talk. It's not being at the UN or the EU. It's there, that audience. They hold the cards. They have all the Trump cards here. It is up to the medical world. It always has been. Uh, and so I really, I, I felt incredibly tense, but I was just filled with joy to do this. Okay. Just filled with joy. I mean, this was a, a dream come true. And, uh, you know, if I perish from a heart attack tomorrow, it's okay. I mean, really, I, I've sort of done my bit at this point. It went very well. Uh, the, the, uh, the reception to it was very, very good. Uh, that's all I can say. They, there is no tape. The whole thing was a n no virtual content, they said. 
for this for this uh, entire conference. And uh, I've looked around on the web. No, there's no bootlegs. There's a couple of pictures that made it into Twitter. That's it. Uh, however, I have the presentation for anybody who'd like to see it. I'm, I'm proud of that presentation. And this does indicate I'm now I was not pushing new policy there. I was rewarding them for what they'd done and making the point that they have the whip hand. Okay. It is up to them now to, to kind of carry this forward. Uh, and I think that's very significant that, that uh, they, they will be. And as I say, I don't know the extent of the pushback in the rest of the medical world. We haven't seen it yet. But, you know, if I, if I told you this was going to happen a year ago, you, you'd probably think I was being very, very optimistic. Uh, and I'm as surprised to some extent as anyone by, by all these actions. And the fact that they've happened so quickly, one after the other. Uh, so that, that I find is a, a very hopeful sign um, and, and something I did not expect. So I guess I, I guess my question with all this is, you know, China obviously wants to make money, but I would think even with all the money you can make with organ, forced organ harvesting, doesn't that seem like such a high risk uh, business? Like if, if that, if that comes out, how could they afford that? Why would they think they can risk doing that? Look, I, I think that's a great question. I don't really have a a fantastic answer to that, except that there's a lot of irrationality. I, look, I think two things. One is that it's very hard to change. When the, when the party allows you to do something, it's very hard for them to change their policy. Uh, it's kind of like you set this steamroller in one direction, and then you have to somehow turn it, and they, they, they're not good at that, uh, particularly when there's a lot of money involved. Uh, secondly, they are destroying it. Don't forget, they're doing two things. They're not just making money. They're destroying enemies of the state. 28-year-olds are the most dangerous people you have in any movement. That was true in Falun Gong. It's true with the Uyghurs. 28-year-olds, you know, these are the people who are no longer youths. They have a little bit of the beginnings of wisdom, yet they're at perfect health. They're, they're, they're vibrant. And uh, you are taking out that population. That's very important. Yeah, and I, I want to add one one thing to that, which is, the, like, you want to, you're talking about the Communist Party making a lot of money, but I think... What's probably happening on the ground, and Ethan, correct me if I'm wrong here, is that the people who are making money are individuals. So you've got individual doctors, you've got individual uh, party members and uh, people in charge of camps who are all getting their cuts, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, like the, the, it's not like Xi Jinping is like, give me all the money to support the Chinese economy. It's just a bunch of corrupt people, probably tens of thousands scattered across, and it's very hard to like – stop that corruption once it happens in the way that it's always hard to stop corruption. I, I agree with you, Matt, but I honestly don't know. And I mean, I think it's very important. You know, one of the things I'm sort of faced with in these, you know, when I give talks to kind of more human rights audiences is some guy will stand up, usually about my age, he'll stand up and say, I've got a question. Why don't you follow the money? Guys love to say that. Okay. It is just, I <laughs> talk about sort of dumb mansplaining. It's like, yeah, that was the name of a movie, okay? Right? It's like, you know, if, I mean, okay, it wasn't the name of a movie. It's a, but it's, it's the key the key statement out of uh, what all the, all the presidents meant or whatever. Uh, the Watergate movie. The, look, you can't follow the money in China. Everybody lies about money. Money, uh, you know, when you make money, you record it as a loss. It's a negative in, 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 in China. Okay? They... It's very, very hard because everybody is trying to evade taxes. And uh, that is the, the part of the society. It's part of Chinese culture. So we don't, we can't really follow the money, but I suspect it's much what you just said, Matt, that it's, it's, it goes to a lot of people. A lot of people wet their beaks on this. I, I think the deeper problem here, though, is that I think even though the Chinese have kind of, Beijing, or the party, has kind of wanted to stop this and rationalize it, and partly so they can wet their beak in a more formal way, all right, especially with the Uyghurs, because with Falun Gong, it was really out of control. You had those competing uh, courtroom scenes that I, that I mentioned. But the future for China has always been pharmaceuticals, always. Okay, that's where the big money is. You have this huge population, which you can test drugs on. 
you know, if they die or get sick or something, you can uh, hush it up really easily. So you can, you can really move fast. Uh, you know, pharmaceuticals has been the, the, a pillar industry for China. It was always that way. It was supposed to be that way. But what ruined it? Well, COVID. Okay. Uh, the pandemic ruined all that because uh, selling pharmaceuticals is a confidence game. People have to have confidence in your product. Even, even though it doesn't even matter about the testing. They have to have confidence that it's coming from a good uh, background. And at this point, any Chinese equivalent of the FDA is, is, is laughable. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not a good competitor. And they're, they're, uh, in fact, their COVID vaccines were terrible. Were, what, 50% effective at best? Look, I think it is still one of the strangest things to me that they've still been considered, they can continue to do this. I agree with you. It is a, a huge question. To me, everything rational would tell me, stop doing that, put everything into pharmaceuticals, get rich, okay? Get really rich. This has never made sense to me, uh, but uh, apparently it's so, it's so developed. Oh, this is what we tried to get to in our 2016 report uh, that I did with David Kilgore and David Maidis was, you know, how huge this industry has become. And so it's very hard to shut down. And uh, they can, the only thing they could do was kind of rationalize it and just pull it out from one population. Now, eventually they are going to run out of Uyghurs. It will take some time, but they will. And uh, when they do, I think they'll be start to look at some people from Hong Kong, and they're certainly looking at the Tibetans now. Uh, they've just started DNA testing and blood testing the entire Tibetan population. They've done it to the Mongolians. If they get Taiwan. And Taiwan. <laughs> and, uh, and that's where we run into something interesting. If I just briefly change the subject, if you want to segue out of the... the uh, organ harvesting, because I was living in Taiwan. I just got back from Taiwan. Uh, yeah. two weeks well, I guess I would just add one more quick point mm -hmm. about what you just said. Like, Also, there is now an entire system full of people who are very incentivized to make sure that this system never comes to light. Absolutely. I think that's another part of it, is the secrecy is its own support in a certain way. Uh, there are people who are dependent on making money on this, uh, there, you know, one of the things that uh, Falun Gong researchers noticed was that there's an incredibly high suicide rate among transplant surgeons. And, you know, I had kind of a funny conversation. I believe it was somebody from New Tang Dynasty. And no, it was probably from Epic Times. But somebody I knew at Epic Times, not Matt Robertson, but somebody else, called me up and said, Ethan, look at these suicide figures. It's unbelievable, right? All these people jumping out of windows and so forth. And they said, you know, you know, it's it's really kind of a, you know, it's in a way it's it's really horrible to look at this, but in another way I feel, you know, at least these people feel guilty or have a conscience, and I'm like, they didn't kill themselves; they were pushed. You know, it's like, come on, I mean, this is this is mob action, okay? And they're basically told, you know, if you don't, you know, here's the gun, finish yourself off, otherwise we'll kill your whole family. I mean, that's very Roman, right? Uh, this is something that's been around since the hills, but I definitely think that's going on. And I think in, in many of these, in some of these cases, they, they're considered to be unreliable, that they might turn, that they might speak to somebody, that they might even anonymously. Uh, and if that's uncovered or there's any sense that the person is no longer reliable, they're finished off. Well, I mean, that's a, that would be a good reason why the, there's so few, um, eyewitness testimonies from Chinese doctors, which is that the, the small percentage of those doctors who are the most likely to be willing to speak out against it have sort of been uncovered and uh, decided of their own accord to jump out of a high window. Well, it, it, yes, it says, in a sense, there's that. And I, I think the other thing is, of course, first of all, when people say that, it's a little bit absurd. I mean, uh, people say, well, how? why aren't there more doctors coming out? It's like, really, do you remember... You know, I remember during the Holocaust that, you know, we just had that, you know, just all those Nazi commandants standing up and saying, you know, I, I didn't want to talk about this, but something terrible is going on in Germany. I'm sorry. Do you remember that? 
I, I, somehow it escapes my memory that anyone from the German side stood up and said, there, we're, we're killing off all the Jews. There's a final solution. This Were we supposed happened. to learn something from the Holocaust? I, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's old history, you know, it's, it's for your grandfather or something. Look, the point is that why would we expect that doctors would do this? It's a miracle that we have uh, Ember Totti around. We also have Dr. Ka. Cohen Jia, the mayor of Taipei, who admitted to me, and you know, and 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 also admitted to me in writing that he this had happened, that he was, you know, it was we're trying to work out a deal for some of his patients back in Taiwan to come over and get some organs, and the, uh, I think it was Wuxi People's Hospital. He didn't tell me that, but I've kind of deduced that since then. Of Wuxi People's Hospital. Uh, basically the doctors there said, well, look, you know, we're giving you a deal because we'll give you kind of the family price, about 50% of the usual foreigner price, not really the Chinese price, but the family price. And all the organs will come from Falun Gong. Uh, and these people, they don't drink, they don't smoke, they practice very healthy Qigong. And uh, so you don't have to worry about the quality of the organs. They're not coming from prisoners who've been drug addicts and so forth, or hepatitis. Uh, now, you know, Ka, Dr. Ka admitted that to my face and also to Lee Shai Lamish, who was in the room with me. We both <laughs> heard it. And I proceeded to eventually uh, clarify the story with him and say, is this correct? And he came back and said, yeah, the story seems OK. And then eventually I asked if I could use his name in my book. And then he got involved in politics. And all of a sudden he said, oh, well, you know, Mr. Gutman must be confusing me with some other doctor. <laughs> this is okay. He's not in China. He's no. Nobody's forcing him. Nobody's going to push him out a window. Well, maybe they would. Uh, but you know, the problem is that even in a, a free society like Taiwan, there's a blackmail potential, right? Uh, I'm sure he did a lot of things in China, some of which he probably doesn't want them to come out. But people do things in China. I, even I did things in China. I'm not so proud of. Uh, well, that, that's a good time to pitch your your book from 20 years ago, Losing the New China, which, is, <laughs> which I know it's not relevant, but but having read it, it was actually really fascinating. It's a really interesting look at Westerners going into China to make money, one of whom was you. One of whom was me, but I wasn't yeah. really there to make money. I was kind of more there to have a good time, I guess. And see, see well, that, that chapter's in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> I will remind everyone this is a family-friendly show. It's a family-friendly show, and I'm still married. To, it's over 25 years now. The same woman. It's, we're, we're in the same house. Uh, so I think everything's worked out okay. Well, you know. But uh, look, the bottom line here is that that we, we can't expect doctors to just come out and, and tell us everything. And we can't expect them to put it on the Internet. And this is why... Uh, I do the research I do, which involves going out and talking to witnesses wherever they are. Hopefully they're in Turkey. It's much easier to do it there. Okay. Or, or, you know, but most of the time you have to go all the way to Kazakhstan or some terrible state, uh, <laughs> which is authoritarian and basically sees the Chinese interest as, as whatever Beijing wants, Beijing gets. And so you've got, it's, it's very problematic. Uh, and the Chinese have put up a very good fight here. And they've done a great job on, on squelching this information. But, you know, and this is where I give tremendous credit is to the medical world for finally seeing through that or saying, look, if there's even a chance that this is going on, we simply can't be involved. And that that is a, an amazing transformation, beginnings of a transformation. There may be a lot of fighting to come uh, in this area. And I don't think it will solve it. I'll also be honest there. Look, this is very similar to what happened with the, uh, my, both my parents were psychologists and, uh, you know, the American, uh, the, the World uh, Psychiatric Association st stood up in the 1960s and started denouncing the Soviet Union for torturing dissidents in mental hospitals. And they never relented on that. And it didn't matter where you stood in the Vietnam War, if you liked Nixon or hated him. It, it went on and on and on that, the, that we would have no contact with the psychiatrists of the Soviet Union or psychologists. Nothing. All right. We didn't we didn't make drugs with them, you know, psychoactive drugs. We didn't they didn't allow them to our conferences. They couldn't come and train in America or in the West anywhere. 
this continued all the way into the Gorbachev era and even a few years after the Soviet Union <laughs> ceased to exist, okay? And I'm afraid it probably never did it affect, did it get better treatment for the dissidents who were being tortured in Soviet mental hospitals? We'll never know. Maybe it did. Probably it didn't. But you know what? Uh, we There is no shame. The World Psychiatric Association has no shame. They have nothing to apologize for. In this case, the medical world, without making too fine a point on it, I mean, yes, some people like Delmonico ought to at least acknowledge that some mistakes were made. Okay. Uh, that was a terrible thing. For two, from 2012 to 2016, we had four years where me and Matus and Kilgore and Matt Robertson and Jacob Levy could not, uh, were not invited to have almost anything. Okay. <laughs> we just weren't. We had, nobody wanted to hear us because the system was taking care of it. The system was handling it. They were handling it with China. And, uh, I, you know, I'm all for engagement when you think it's going to work, but if you've got no evidence that it will work, there's no, it's, it's the worst thing possible because that was a terrible period. A lot of Falun Gong died and even some Uyghurs too during that period. This was a terrible period. And this, uh, you know, uh, so I think, you know, we have to acknowledge that as well. And one of the worst things about, uh, this business is that people are so eager to wipe out the history right after it's over, 10 minutes after it's gone. It's like 10 minutes ago that you were hitting your wife. Now you're not. And everything's okay now. Now it's cool. No, it's like, no, normally you'd say, well, you know, you need to go see a therapist. Okay. You guys need at least couples therapy. Or maybe we need to do an intervention. I don't know. Not in the medical world. It's been like, well, you know, if the Chinese have reformed, then it's all okay. But they're not a third world country. This is a country with a, you know, well-established country. It's not like you can say, well, they just came out of the, you know, the jungle or something. They did not. They know what they're doing. And um, so this idea that we can just wipe out history is the, the worst thing. And, you know, there's a, the Wellcome Trust in England puts a lot of emphasis on medical history and how important it is for the medical world to come and look at ethical standards over time. What about this? This is the major issue. They put, they've never put a penny into it. Okay? That's, the, that's where I want to get my money from. Okay? Not from the U.S. government. Welcome trust. All right? Because uh, this has been a... Uh, that, that's, that's the worst part of it. Now, okay, rant over on that. But Well, so you, I know you were recently in Taipei for about seven months. Uh, what, what was happening there? Well, I was going there to do some some more research, final research on my book, and uh, I wasn't that successful. Well, you know what? You can't win them all, okay? I did very well in Tajikistan one year, did very well in Kazakhstan <laughs> one year. This is uh, a little different. I was trying to bring out some loose ends, particularly on Thermo Fisher. Thermo Fisher is a company which is Thermo Fisher Scientific, Thermo Fisher Medical, which sells DNA kits. Okay, so they sell, they've sold maybe 10 million DNA kits to China to test them for the Uyghurs. And these are not the fun DNA kits where, you know, you learn that, hey, Matt, you know, you're actually African, part African, just way back there. You know, it's like, it's not that kind of, you know, you're part American Indian, though, you don't look it, but, you know, no, it's not that. Oh, like Senator Warren. <laughs> right, exactly. This isn't the Senator Warren stuff. This is so they can tissue match you, as tissue type you with, with, uh, 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 you know, with somebody who needs an organ. Right, to establish my value as a human being. Right, well, uh, you know, we can... Uh, she's not running this. It doesn't look like she's running this time around. Okay, well, anyways, the point is the... Uh, so I wanted to see. We we still have to establish exactly which kits they used, and does Thermo Fisher have any feelings about this? Do they, you know... Uh, I think it's very important to, if if a company does something like that, which is very similar to what we saw in the Holocaust, where the you know you had IBM selling punch cards to the Nazis, which were used to keep track of the Jews as they uh, marched them into the gas chambers. This is, uh, you know, and, and IBM said, well, we, we didn't really know what it was being used for. You know, that's always the excuse. But the fact is, that there's no way that Thermo Fisher didn't know what this was being used well, for. Well, Ethan, did you follow the money? <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you for that. Brilliant. I, I actually did try to do that. The way I tried to follow it was I was I was looking into companies which were competitors of Thermo Fisher in uh, Taiwan because I figured they would have studied this pretty closely, uh, but they they pretty much clammed up. Uh, at any rate, the bottom line is uh, I did get some sense, though, of what Taiwan is facing, which is sort of a different topic. Uh, in terms of a potential invasion and all that, or a blockade. And uh, I, I did want to report something which I thought was kind of interesting, which links into this DNA business. Uh, now, my source on this is uh, a fellow who's up very high up in the uh, security chain and diplomatic chain in Beijing. He's an American, and he... Uh, sat down with me and explained that there is a belief in Chinese, um, in, in, in the part, Hmong party members now, top party members, that the reason that Taiwan is being recalcitrant about joining China is because there's a, what they call the 10% problem. The 10% of the Taiwanese are said to have Japanese blood, partially. Go on. Okay, and, and this is what's causing the problem. So they're not truly Chinese. They've been, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but they've kind of been infiltrated in this way, and that's what's the problem. Now, what's interesting about that figure is not what it tells you about uh, China's actual plans, except for one thing. They've given you a figure now, not of who's actually going to test Japanese their blood and the DNA test, that it's going to be American Indian or whatever. Uh, no, the, what they're going, what they're telling you here is that they're going to take ten percent of the population of Taiwan and neutralize them, re-educate them, whatever. And this is where we come back to uh, Chris's remark about what would be the next vulnerable group. Well, it's interesting that they're doing like, like. The Communist Party is, would not be the first ethno-nationalist state to say that a certain percentage of this region has been infiltrated by this, you know, other blood, and yeah. then therefore needs to be eliminated. No, it's not hardly the first. I mean, it's, I, I, that's occurred for thousands of years in history. What's amazing is it's apparently occurring now among diplomats who this guy knows. Okay, these are people he has lunch with and hangs out with, and they say this quite seriously. There's 10% Japanese, this Japanese blood infiltration in, inside Taiwan. Uh, and I, that he found this personally shocking. These are otherwise intelligent people. Right. Well, what's also interesting is looking at the history of the Chinese Communist Party over the last 70 years or so, they often have these type of campaigns where they say like, you know, 5% or 10% of the population is a, a counter-revolutionary or a rightist or an intellectual. And they it's it's small enough that they can get, you know, you, you don't need the other 90% to go after them. You only need part of that 90%, but it'll still be a larger than the targeted group, right? And that way uh, you can get a, a chunk of the rest of society to say, oh, thank goodness I'm not part of that group. And now I'm going to help the Communist Party uh, go after these bad guys. Right. And uh, the life and expectancy of those groups is never very high. No. It, but it's also just like, it's, it sounds like one of those things where like, you know, Mao used to just give these like arbitrary like targets like, oh yeah, one in 10 people is a counter-revolutionary. And it's up to the village cadres to identify the one in 10 people that then need to be punished or, or killed or, or whatever it is. Uh, like, it's just so reminiscent of that, uh, like that communist party way of doing things. It's very Maoist in a way. It is. It's got, it, it, it had, it brought back all kinds of memories. The interesting thing is that it's really being based on much more on genetics these days. So that, which, which also ties into what we see in, uh, what I'm, my theory about why the Uyghurs were chosen to be the uh, group that they would start harvesting from, uh, which I believe is much more racial and much less to do with religion. Okay. With Falun Gong, it really was 
about religion. Okay, it clearly wasn't ethnic in any way. It was, uh, and it wasn't based on how much money you made or even your profession or anything like that. It was simply based on the fact that you uh, were basically. It was a uh, similar to the Spanish Inquisition. You you had to convert or die. Uh, and with, I don't believe that's really happening so much. Uh, the Islam uh, is the central issue with the Uyghurs. I believe it is racial. And my proof for that is the, the level of rape, uh, which is extremely high in the camps. It's something beyond what we saw in Fallen Gone. And it's very uh, a purposeful rape. It's, it's, it's very purposeful that, you know, it's a, a male, uh, Han Chinese male raping Chinese women. Or raping, or raping. Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Han Chinese male raping Uyghur women or Uyghur men in some cases. Now, there's a lot of cases of this. Uh, that's racial. That doesn't strike me as about religion or is you know or Islam as this big threat. This is much more about dominance in a very crude way. Um. Now, I'm not saying any group was treated worse than the other. That's not my point here in any way. Uh, because as you know, I had entire chapters on torture of Falun Gong in my book. Uh, and it's hair-raising. But what we see with the Uyghurs is less of the torture and more of the rape. And to me, that that indicates this, this racial aspect fairly strongly. Uh, and it goes along with, you know, there's other findings as well about the, the uh, attempted testing this endless testing of the Uyghurs. Uh, and it seems like at some points they were trying to show how close the Uyghurs, initially they were trying to sort of say, aha, you think you're special and you're Uyghur, but actually you're really Chinese underneath it. You're just like us. So stop acting different. Uh, and that dropped after a while. And then it became an interest in showing how the Uyghurs were some way inferior at people. Uh, and that is something I'm very well familiar with from maybe if you remember from Losing the New China, I talk about dancing in Uyghur restaurants and all that stuff. That was the standard thing. It was like going to a Negro jazz club, what I read about Negro jazz clubs in the 20s in America. It is, it was, uh, you know, you'd go there for a good time, but you were kind of like, well, these people are, you know, primitive and they're, 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 they're doing this, this is jungle music and so forth. That is very much the attitude about Uyghurs today. Okay. So they're, they're, they're there for the performance uh, to show that they're one of the happy 56 ethnic minority groups or whatever. And that's a little, bit, a little more than that. They're seen as their dancing is seen as much more sensual. OK, mm-hmm. uh, the music is, is by far the best music in Beijing uh, it is because it's really, truly rhythmic, in my opinion. But uh, it's fantastic music. The women are fantastically beautiful and as, as dancers and so forth. And, and that all of those things combine. Uh, tell you kind of how they're observed. There's other methods of proof as well. I mean, when after the terrorist, supposed terrorist attack, we don't even know really who did it in Kunming train station, uh, they used to make everybody wait in Shanghai and Beijing and uh, uh, for the train. They had to go through a weapon screening before they got on the subway, the MRT, whatever. And uh, that would take hours. And this was, they simply did that, oh, I don't know, they did it for six months or something. That's an incredible waste of people's time. I mean, it's several hours out of their day. Now, that, you know, even in New York City after 9-11, they never put up something like this. There was never any kind of real weapon screening. And so I think that's very significant. This was a, a, a calculated attempt to make people who hate this population as well. Uh so I, I'm really not, I don't see a way back from that. The interesting thing is whether the Taiwanese understand if they're that they're kind of under the same level of threat, even if yeah. it's invented here. Well, you know the about the the Japanese DNA thing. You could work with Thermo Fisher to you know issue DNA tests across <laughs> Taiwan. <laughs> if it's true, they jump, they jump all over that. <laughs> I don't know how their competitors are going to feel about that. Well, anyways, well, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be selling more DNA kits and really isn't that what's important? I, and actually, I think Thermo Fisher has established that selling more DNA kits is what's important. 
Well, that's anyways, this is a very interesting issue with Thermo Fisher. I don't know if we'll get to the complete bottom of it. I think it ultimately it's going to take a congressional investigation. But I, you know, I it is interesting because Taiwan is still in a very politically precarious place. I mean, you've got the Greens, you've got the Blues, right? And uh, the Greens are, you know, sort of the supposedly pro independence party and so all that. But they don't, because they were the out party for so many years, or the non existent party, or the illegal party for so many years, they don't get along with the military, particularly the army. They consider the army was the, the army was something, you know, it shot people who, who stood up and for democracy in that country. And the mistrust still exists. So in some ways you can look at it and say, well, the KMT then, the blue, should come in. But the blues have their own problems. I mean, they, the problem is that they're much more Chinese, if you like. They're less Taiwanese and they're more Chinese. They kind of always want to make a deal. And so that's the worry there. So we're in this very precarious position. They do get along better with the military. Uh, and I don't know how to solve this problem at all. I mean, I did come up with one idea, which was that we should really have a military guy from America who would sort of bang heads together. Who would have just come over to Taiwan and act as a... I, I'm not a talking about an on-the-ground advisor. I'm talking about a bureaucratic advisor who would, would help out. Um, but there is some dysfunction in the military there. And there's also the feeling that uh, America can save us. America will save us when the time comes. The problem with that is that the... I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this, you let me know, but the average GDP, the GDP per person uh, in Taiwan just surpassed that of Japan. That means it's one of the wealthiest countries in the world today. It's extraordinarily wealthy. You know, they make the Ukraine look like a bunch of peasants. They make Israel look like, you know, significantly lower. This is a phenomenally active economy. And the fact that they are only spending 2% of it 2.5 now uh, on it on the military is ridiculous, frankly. I mean, Israel is its lowest rate of spending on the military right now. It's 5.5%. That's the lowest it's ever been in Israel. Okay. Ukraine, when the, the, the Russians attacked, was at 3.5. You'd think, I mean, it, Taiwan should at least be at 3.5. It's a phenomenally productive economy. And, I, you know, I used to say this to people. They'd say sort of like, how do we get, we need to study Washington. We need to study how to make sure that the Americans will come in and help when it's time. And I said, you shouldn't be studying Washington. You should be studying Ukraine. You're studying how they did this. How they did, this is a miracle. That they're, that they're still fighting. You should be studying, you should be studying Israel. You should go to that country and, and study everything they do militarily. Uh, and how they are able to raise taxes, and how uh, how how do they do this? Uh, how can they do that level of spending? Because you need to do that level of spending, because America will help those who help themselves. This is the bottom line, and uh, you know, so it's it's interesting to see how they're changing, and maybe they will change a little quicker. Uh, informally, we're seeing some opinion polls which are showing a much greater willingness to fight now. Uh, in Taiwan than was previously the case. So uh, there may be a glimmer of hope. And I'm not talking about, you know, people holding stupid demonstrations and walking around with flags and all that. That's not the way it's done. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be done that way. This is, um, but, you know, the Chinese are putting a lot of pressure on and the assumption for most Taiwanese is that they are, it's all, it's all talk. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's a very odd period right now of incredible wealth. I mean, I've never seen, I mean, even even China, I, I, Taiwan, Taipei, the city has changed so much. I've been going there since 1994. And uh, this time I was just absolutely stunned. The city looks great. So prosperous. So we'll see. And that is where, you know, that's that's kind of where I'm going to leave the Taiwan situation right now. I don't have a lot of great answers for it, uh, but I can see the, the, the kinds of threats that are building. There's, these are 
close on the horizon. Uh, so on the other hand, having said that, I, I just want to add one more thing. Every time the Chinese surround the island and, you know, encroach on the airspace and fire off guns from the, uh, the missiles, uh, I am is a good day for me, a happy day. Because every day they do that, I see that Japan's defense budget goes up a notch every time. Uh, so we are seeing reactions by its neighbors, very strong reactions. Well, that's because Japan understands that a lot of their DNA is actually in Taiwan. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I forgot about that, of course. That's the, it's, this, this, it's the homing signals, you know, <laughs> within the population. Uh yeah, so this is something we're we're seeing. We are seeing a kind of a racial, a racialist China now, a racialist mm -hmm. nationalist China. Uh, you know, I'm at Victims of Communism Foundation, and I find it, I, I, I really find it. Yes, there's the Chinese Communist Party, but no, I really think it's it's about at this point it's it's about national socialism. It's it's a kind of we're not talking about the traditional communists anymore. Um, Han supremacy is definitely a thing. It is definitely a thing. And uh, you can really, you can feel its repercussions all over Asia at this point. Um, well, thank you very much for joining us and giving some good news about organ harvesting, followed by more horrifying news about ethnic cleansing in Taiwan. Um, so a good balance. Thank you, Ethan. <laughs> well, you have to end with the morose things, right? I mean, we... Uh, that's your big point, you know. Since otherwise, why, why, why would people get out of bed in the morning, right? So, uh, <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for joining us again. No, thank you. It's always good to talk to you guys.